it's really a nice pleasure to be able to give a lecture here at this um, ISSI symposium, which I have actually attended a number of times. So yeah, thank you very much. So what I'm going to tell you is uh, today is a story about an ant, and the ant is called Formica execta. Uh, I will kind of compile data and insights we have gained during uh, uh, almost 30 year study of this ant. So part of the data I'm going to present are actually quite old, but I try to put it into a broader context. So uh, this is the place I have been working for, uh, I, I don't care to remember how many years, but quite a long time. This is the time in a zoological station seen from above in the winter. I work there usually in the summer. But this uh, picture perhaps illustrates the core of the questions I'm asking. I'm interested in fragmented landscapes and how that impacts first genetics, but then later on also behavior and other aspects of uh, ant behavior. And just to give you a picture of where the ants are, you can see the stars here. So we have them on several different islands and you can certainly appreciate the fact that this is a highly fragmented landscape for a terrestrial animal. Uh, so um, the sea in between the islands will pose dispersal barriers. And this is the setting for what I'm going to talk about today. So what we have here is a landscape matrix. Uh, these can be different, but this is a fragmented one. And this will dictate what's going to happen in this population over time, uh, including the social biology of the species. But one core factor here is, of course, the dispersal. How do ants disperse uh, between islands and actually initially to the island, islands in the first place, because these islands are reasonably young. Uh, we have land rise in Finland, so they might be just uh, a few uh, hundred years old in terms of being habitable for ants. Uh, so that's a crucial factor, which is going to uh, uh, shape population structure. How different are populations on the different islands genetically? And this population structure, of course, will link inevitably to inbreeding. How similar genetically are individuals on the different islands, not only within the colonies, but across colonies within the islands. And this is kind of the core setting of what I'm going to talk about today. So we have genetic isolation and we have the core genetic factors like drift and inbreeding shaping the gen genetics of the populations and this is dictated by the structure of the landscape, the landscape matrix. Now, the interesting part is that we have different parties. When we study ants, we have different parties. We have the queens and the workers. Uh, so this is not a simple uh, solitary organism, which can be complex enough. Uh, and some things that these uh, factors, genetic factors may in impact is the lifespan of individuals, how long do they live, and how does inbreeding affect that? How do individuals perform, individuals or colonies, uh, under inbreeding versus outbreeding? And this will all sum up into the reproductive output, i.e. the evolutionary fitness of um, these colonies, uh, and the life history strategy, how they go about uh, obtaining some reproductive output and how they meanwhile allocate resources to different functions to uh, adapt to the environment and to hone the reproductive output. And of course, always there are trade-offs in the picture. So life is rife with trade-offs, but when we work with social insects, there are other, some factors which we don't come across when we work on solitary animals. I mean, we have the individuals and we have the colonies. And that means that we have class specific life histories which act at the level of individuals, individuals like sexual individuals and also workers in a sense, in terms of uh, inclusive fitness, uh, try to maximize the fitness. 
And on the other hand, we have the colony life histories. So colonies have to make decisions on sex allocation, reproduction versus maintenance, and also in some cases, immune defense. And individual, individuals, again, have their own longevity. Is it important or not? Dispersal of individuals and the tolerance of the environmental factors that will shape the individual and also the colony fitness. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about immune defense here because time is there's simply not enough time, but I will link these other factors to the genetics and population structure of the population. So as I said, we have studied this species for many year, years. I started in 1993 and <clears throat> actually there has been uh, studies in the population already before that by uh, Bogdan Pisarski, for instance. The most, of the <clears throat> most of the colonies have a single reproductive queen and we have uh, monitored all the colonies we could find uh, for microsatellite DNA genotypes, uh, also for population demography, colony size, colony productivity, etc., etc. All uh, parameters we could almost think of or be able to measure. And this is just to give you an overall view of what it looks like from Google Maps. So we have the station, zoological station is over here. And then we have, actually I could take the laser pointer. And then we have the stars here indicate the islands. Uh, and this is pretty much the area where we can find it, the ants. Uh, if you go further away, we don't really find any colonies of this ant. But the key point here is the scale. So if you see down on the, at the left hand, right hand board, uh, corner, we have 200 meters is a fairly short distance. So you can see that these islands are not huge in any way, and they're not all that far located from each other. And this will probably make you think about a little bit more about what I'm going to tell you in a moment. So if you look at dispersal pattern, because that's one of the key parameters if you want to study ants, how do they disperse? How does the landscape structure actually influence dispersal? And this is a cartoon of how it looks like genetically. You can think of, we have three different islands here. In each island, there are patches with ants on them. And we can think of the different colored uh, uh, sectors here as the frequencies of different alleles on these islands in these uh, patches. So you can see here, uh, if you look at queens and workers, uh, we find that there is actually a huge difference between different uh, patches between in the allele frequencies and also across the islands. And of course, if you analyze many different loci, genetic loci, the same pattern will emerge. So we have actually genetically distinct uh, populations, if you will, also at very, very short distances. If you look at the colony sires, either male, males that father the colonies, uh, a somewhat different picture emerges. You can see that within islands, the fathers are genetically fairly similar, but between islands, we also see uh, a differentiation, which means that this indicates that we have very, very low dispersal rates. If you think about maybe less than 100 years of habitable hub, habitat and the standing population of, or total population of about 200 colonies, this is a quite a strong differentiation. And if you look at just using relatedness estimates, we take the genetic relatedness between individual queens across all the colonies, you can see that the further away the queens are from each other in their nests, the less related they will be. So there's also, this is also a measure of in, uh, isolation by distance, whereas we see nothing like that for the colony fathers. So we have limited dispersal and of course limited dispersal will inevitably for sooner or later lead, lead to inbreeding. 
here's another example. We managed to, using the genetic data we had, used, uh, managed to build a pedigree for the entire population. And you can see here, we have the old queens which have established colonies, and then we collected young queens after the nuptial flight to see how far away from home they were. And as you can see, the median dispersal distance for a queen is 60 met meter, meters from her home or, or natal colony. The picture is a little bit different for, for the male. So you can see there's a tail of long dispersers here and it's a bit more flat. So the median distance is 150 meters, which also is very, very low for a dispersal distance for an, an ant. So 90% of the queens have dispersed less than 550 meters, i.e. within the islands. And 90% of the males have dispersed less than one and a half kilometers, which is also fairly short distance. So we have all the ingredients for drift and inbreeding in the population. And what I'm going to move on to, uh, we, we have also verified this with the genetic analysis that they are indeed inbred. Uh, but this will, will kind of form the basis what I'm, for what I'm going to say next. So if you have inbreeding, what are the fitness consequences of limited dispersal? Are there any consequences? And now we have to think about two different aspects. We have the queen of the colony may be inbred herself, and that's the homozygosity of the queen, but she may not be inbred herself, but have mated with a related male, and that will lead to the workers being inbred. And uh, that is basically due to the relatedness between the colony queen and her male mate. And these will both independently influence how well a colony survives and, and performs. So one of the factors that inbreeding may influence is resource allocation. How do they use resources? Is there any way in which the ants can somehow mitigate negative effects of inbreeding? And uh, here we can think of, for instance, sex ratio. What sex ratio sh should they produce? And how should they allocate uh, resources for between size and number of sexual offspring in this case? So we have trade-offs here. The other is that inbreeding may directly influence colony performance and individual performance. An inbred worker may be less efficient, uh, or an inbred queen may be less efficient in laying eggs and producing new workers and sexuals, for instance. So here we have uh, an example of individual performance. And here we're looking at queen inbreeding uh, measured by the HL index. And you can see we collected young queens after the nuptial flight and we have, here we have its established queens. And you can see that actually young queens seem to be more inbred before they have founded a colony than established ones. So this uh, interpretation uh, the first interpretation would be that young queens, if they're inbred, they're not so good at founding colonies. However, uh, I will come back to this later, there may be other explanations as well. Maybe the population is changing in terms of levels of inbreeding because the young queens are born from old queens, of course. The other aspect is colony lifespan. So you, here we have again the inbreeding index. And you can see that inbred colonies have a shorter lifespan than more outbred one if the queen is outbred. So there's a definite fitness cost to being in, inbred for the queen, but also of course for her workers because she will be active uh, in reproducing for a shorter time. So we have a decline in colony foundation success and longevity with inbreeding. Now, of course, colonies can perform in different ways. So if the workers of the colony are inbred, i.e. colony inbreeding, this seems to impact the sexual production. The more inbred the colony, the fewer sexuals it will produce. And this is direct 
directly at the decline in colony fitness. So Philopatry comes at a cost. Uh, playing the safe game and not dispersing far may come at a cost uh, on the longer term because the colony will be less productive. And here we come in on the question of resource allocation. So, okay, sexual production goes down. However, when we look at the queen and male production of the colony, you can see here that actually male production does not decline with colony inbreeding. And it's the queen that produces the males in the species. Whereas it's a strong decline in queen production, in the production of new queens, uh, with uh, colony inbreeding, which means that there will be fewer, uh, sorry, that inbred colonies will produce a more male by a sex ratio. And also there will be fewer queens that actually enter the queen pool of the population, uh, i.e. Uh, found new colonies in the population. And we think that this is mediated by uh, more of the diploid larvae that are produced at the same time uh, with the sexuals develop into uh, workers rather than queens. So potential queens, coming queens, uh, develop into workers instead because inefficiency, lack of nutrients, uh, or what have you. So this will essentially means that there are fewer new queens coming to the population. And this will, all, of course, raise the questions about uh, how the population will survive in the long term. But it also, if you look at another thing, how, how does it work? Uh, so the colonists don't produce fewer males. They produce the same number of males. But actually what they do, the males are also impacted because they produce smaller males. Uh, you see here, the size of the young queens are the same, maintained across colony inbreeding levels, but male weight decreases with increasing inbreeding. And of course, males cannot be inbred, they are haploid. So, so it cannot be a property of the male itself, uh, but this must be mediated by worker inbreeding. So inbred workers, uh, one way or the other, or for one reason or, or another, produce raise smaller males, either because they are not as efficient or because it is actually an adaptive response for the simple reason that maybe size of the individual in males is not so important. Maybe it doesn't matter if a male is smaller. What matters is that you produce uh, a large enough number of them. So the inbreeding basically seems to modify the trade-off between size and number in different ways for queen and male offspring. So we have, in a sense, uh, also epigenetic determinants of offspring size because these are mediated by the workers that raise the offspring. So they produce uh, favor fewer queens uh, and same number of males, but smaller males. And this may be one of the classical uh, trade-offs in, in evolutionary biology. Uh, male fitness may not be so strongly dependent on the individual, uh, on the size of the individual. So we also, and this is uh, very much work in prog progress. I just got the last results from Nick today. <laughs> So uh, we have been looking at uh, partly the physiology of these. So how do they, uh, the ants actually tolerate different environmental uh, conditions? And in this case, heat and cold. And they may both be important because um, they, the ants will need warm weather to start reproduction in spring. And the earlier they can start, the more likely they are to have a good uh, productivity during the summer. And of course, the nest site will decide how, the, how warm it will be, how much brood they will produce. So uh, heat 
uh, is important for uh, producing uh, brood and the cold can be a factor that limits the start or onset of reproduction in spring. Uh, so we did an experiment where we tested all of this with different degrees of inbreeding, uh, how high the mortality was under high temperature stress. And you may think this is a high temperature for an ant, but I can tell you that we measured the temperature on the top or very close to some mounds. Uh, and the highest one we measured was 68 degrees Celsius. So the colona, colonies are in places which are very, very hot. And then the other, we measured the recovery following uh, maintenance at low temperatures, and that was minus five degrees in a freeze, freezer for a short period of time. And then we looked at how quickly they actually woke up from that. And this is what it looks like. It's quite interesting to see that, in fact, the inbred colony were, had a higher tolerance of heat. And we don't know why this may be. I'm interested to hear any suggestions anyone, someone might have on this. But it's actually a fairly substantial increase in survival time in the inbred colonies, 22%. Uh, and if you look at the cold to tolerance, uh, here again, you can see that the blue line is the low inbreeding, the red one is the high inbreeding. Here we have a small but significant effect uh, in favor of the less inbred um, colonies or ants. So we do get effect effects from, from the environmental variables such as heat and cold that influence survival of the ants. This is, as I said, very much work in progress. Uh, so I'm in very interested to hear any suggestions on, on how to explain, especially the heat tolerance outcome. So inbred workers are better able to withstand high temperatures, but slightly lower, to, uh, slower to recover from cold temperatures. So we have found effects of inbreeding on a number of different parameters that characterize colonies or colony life. And we see that there are several trade-offs uh, that are influenced by these, um, uh, by inbreeding. And just as a final part, what will happen in the population uh, I have studied it for a good number of years, and uh, it's my impression that the number of colonies is declining. And if you think, look at this graph, um, the more inbred the queen is, the more inbred her diploid offspring will be. This is queens and workers. But that means that when queen inbreeding increases, if it increases, then also the new queens will be more inbred. And uh, my thought was that maybe this leads to some sort of a cascading effect uh, of increasing inbreeding in the population. So I, I put together the data I had uh, on inbreeding coefficients uh, in new versus old colonies. And this is what it looks like. As you can see, the data stops at about 2012. We have now we are working on this data, so we are adding colonies up to last year. So uh, whether there really is a trend or not remains to be seen. But based on this data, it seems that actually inbreeding has increased in the population since the start of the study. And this will, of course, uh, is, is of course likely to influence the extent to which uh, this population will be able to continue to exist in the future. So on this note, I would like to pull together. What we can see from this is that knowing the ecological genetics uh, can allow us to provide forecasts for the population uh, and, and also understand some of the changes in life history trade-offs that we, can, we have seen here. And also an issue 
because this species has sex bias dispersal, males disperse more than females, this has been seen as a way to avoid invading. And also very often ants are cited for uh, not being in inbred because they have uh, these nuptial flights, but the species has nuptial flights, yet it is inbred. So we can find somewhat contradictory predictions from this. And we can also see that inbreeding depression really is actualized via reduced reproductive success, both at the individual and colony, colony level. And this can eventually lead to reduced population viability. So with this, I would like to th thank you for your attention and uh, also thank collaborators so far. Cathy Hag Leotard was involved uh, with this work for uh, quite a while uh, as a postdoc uh, in Helsinki. Emma uh, still hasn't been able to get rid of it, so she's still working on it and did her PhD on it. And Nick Voss has uh, joined a team with uh, the more recent uh, projects. And then, of course, uh, all the field assistants and former students that have been a summer or two involved in collecting data and so on. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>